Welcome back. Uh, we're back again with uh, Sourcing Challenge Weekly. Um, as always, every week, I'm here again with my good friend, Dov. Dov, how has your week been? It's been a really long week. A lot of things were happening, but I'm good. And it's funny because I'm, again, wearing black and you're all, always matching colors. That's amazing. <laughs> I, I, I try. <laughs> do, do, you have, uh, do you have a hat for each of your jumpers that come together? Mm, no, or? I'm slowly working on it. But uh, yeah, event, I, I think, I guess eventually I will. Uh, but yeah, it's about finding the right budget. And always yeah. like, do I, do I have a, you know, when I have another jumper, it's like, do I have anything that goes with that? Uh, sometimes I just have a mishmash, but I like color coordination. Yeah. Hashtag lifetime goals. So <laughs> <laughs> what like, about you? you know, How's your week been? A shoe closet. I have a hat closet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. My week's been good. Uh, busy as always. Uh, agency life, uh, I guess. Uh, well, it is. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that's partly what we wanted to talk about as well. Uh, for anybody who saw us last week, uh, definitely recommended to go and watch the recruiting lunch break. Uh, what was on? I think that working was. lunch. Yeah, working lunch exactly. Uh, where Dov was. Well, the preface was that it was a, like, what's hardest, in-house recruitment or agency recruitment? Uh, obviously, you've been on both sides of it. You've been in-house. You've been agency. You've been in between by being an RPO. Um, and then Lee was on the other side and it was supposed to be like, well, agency is harder. The, the whole preface was she put on brain food that she had applied for an in-house job and she didn't understand why they weren't, you know, uh, bending over backwards to hire her because she has whatever number of years of uh, agency experience. I think from my kind of point of view, it, it derailed a bit when it, well, Lee isn't exactly like the archetypical agency person she owns her own agency, which makes the whole thing completely different. And that was for me is like, that's not the same conversation because essentially owning your own agency is more akin to you want to, you know, you want to be a manager because, you know, whether you're owning your own agency of just you, uh, you're essentially similar to us as freelancers. But when you apply for an in-house job, if that's an individual contributor role, you're still looking at a different kind of things. Like, do you, do you want an individual contributor role or do you want a manager role? Uh, and that, you, you thankfully never got into that discussion. But yeah, the whole preface of like, which one is harder was, we, I think we talked about it as well. Like, that's not really what it's about at the end of the day, you know, and that's never what yeah. it's about. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with that because, um, and, and I think I mentioned that, on the during that conversation that I don't think it's the right question because we have different people who have different skills and in-house and agency are two different environments and and the question is where you can thrive uh, I know that I've tried both and being in the middle and I guess I was fortunate especially being in the middle with with RPO rec to rec kind of in, in that kind of way that that was very different. That's nowhere near the quality of um, attention to to people mm. who that we were speaking to that I've seen ever in my life in general. Because we were like really, we really cared about each and yeah. every single person. Um, on the other hand, well, it, it, for me, it was a, a difficult kind of place to be in the, in the conversation because, you know, um, both uh, Lee and Debbie, they were kind of agency. And, and, and my point going into the conversation, I'm not against agencies yeah. and I didn't want to come across as someone who is against agencies because again, one of my points that I raised was that it's about, you know, agency is a last resort and there are a lot of companies that rely on agencies to step in for really tricky roles yeah. And if the agency is very niche, focusing on specific skills that are needed, then they could be the, the market go-to place to get the right people. Because if they're doing things really well, they have the active pool of candidates because they're interacting with them. They, they're yeah. keeping them warm. Now, if I'm starting the search, it will take me longer to, to do this research, to, to, to send the messages, and then to actually 
get those conversations going. You know yourself, like that takes time. But with agencies, I think my, uh, my biggest concern is, and I think that certain agencies are doing the service themselves, you know, like bad PR in a way themselves. Uh, I like, again, you can throw a stone at me. <laughs> I said it on the show. Um, I'm sick and tired of seeing agency recruiters shouting out loud on LinkedIn. Oh, I made my hire. I'm going to ring a bell. I got a bottle of champagne. I'm a best biller of the month. I've never seen an in-house person talk about, oh my God, look at me. I just filled this role. Because no, that's, I mean, what, that's what you expect to do. I, I, I have, if it's, if it's been a role that everybody knows it's a difficult hiring manager. It's a difficult role to fill. Like I've seen that where it's like, you know, this has been open for a year. We finally filled it. Um, I think just as much as the other thing that I didn't like is that we say like agency versus in-house. Um, there's so many different types of agencies. Like agency incorporates anything from, the headhunting company consultancy that does, you know, everything retained to your high street, uh, where I started, uh, your high street agency that's used to having walk-ins and, you know, they just pump out job, job ads and hoping people go in and anything in between. Uh, and in-house, again, is anything from like, you know, the, 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 the person specializing in sourcing and top of funnel to, again, the one that's really kind of executive search and, and works in that kind of way. So it, it's very much, I mean, from traditionally kind of, and that's partly why it always comes up. It's like, you know, oh, uh, you know, in-house recruiters always, they, they don't like agencies because they're afraid that they're going to take away work and uh, agencies sees in-house recruiters as people who failed in an agency. And what I've seen most of the time is like, like a lot of the people that I've seen move from agency to in-house is that one is stability of actually having a steady income, and especially if a large portion of your salary is, is commissions. Um, and the other one is like, which is mostly what I've seen is that people want to have a family and the agency life, because of the way most of the, the salary structures are set up, is not a nine to five job. And I mean, recruitment isn't, but with in-house, we have that flexibility of kind of saying, if most of what I do is North America, then, you know, I'm not getting up early. I'm working late. Uh, whereas agency is like, well, you're getting up early and you're staying late. Uh, but yeah, I, exactly. As, as you said, it's a, it depends on how specialized they are. Uh, if they are specialized in a specific niche, what they're saying is like, we have this network of people, then, then it's, and it's like, it's not everybody that is like, everybody says that they're specialized, but at the end of the day, it's like their job is to make money. Whereas uh, the in-house recruiters, the job is to fill the roles, whether that's with an agency candidate, somebody applied, an internal you know, candidate, a referral, or somebody who we source ourselves, we don't really care. Whereas the agency is like, I need to fill this role with one of our candidates that, you know, that accepts the job. Um, like I'm an agency now, and I've, I've always, I always looked at like, what would it be like to work in an agency with all the tools and all the knowledge that I have from having been RPO and specializing in sourcing. And the thing that's, you know, that's the hardest, which is always the hardest is that because I, you know, I work in an agency where, you know, we're lucky enough to work with some key clients that I can kind of get a similar to, to in-house where I understand the pitch. I know what the, the kind of deal is with the, with the company. I know how to pitch it. I know what they're looking for. But I'm still looking at like, well, either I fill a role, you know, I fill some role this month with that client or I need to, to work with one of our other clients because it's all about the target of filling the job. Um, it's not always about filling that specific job with that client. It's like I need to, you know, I need, you know, my employer to make money. Uh, and, you know, that means I have to fill it for one of our clients and we want to fill those jobs but we're always in competition and not with another colleague, but with, you know, another agency or somebody else. So, or Which many agencies, many, That's I mean, thing. thankfully I, 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 you know, we, I don't work in that environment where like, I've seen that before as well. It's like, Oh, you want to work with us? It's like, yeah, you're not PSL. It's like, if, if I hear the word PSL, I'm going to run away screaming. Cause it's like me and how many others it's like, look, it's either yeah. you want to work with me and work with me as a partner or, you know, it's not, it's not that important for me because I know with a PSL, it's like, okay, that means 
a lot of paperwork, which I'm not afraid of paperwork, but it's just the thinking of it. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, what I've seen now is like the agency model is far from perfect, but neither is the in-house model. I mean, we're still fighting about, um, you know, fighting about getting actually recognized sourcing as a spe- specialism, um, both on the agency side and on in-house side. So, yeah. and 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 again, this is. Um, it's not about what is harder, what is better. That's two different worlds. You know, I remember Lee was, uh, was saying that, oh, but it's all about multitasking. It's, I think it's nothing is about multitasking because the, 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 and again, you know, for me to be in that debate, it was different because I'm not a recruiter. I'm not a full cycle person. I'm a sorcerer, right? So my, my responsibility is very limited. I'm not owning the process. Yeah. So, however, I have quite a lot of friends uh, and I've been part of big teams and I've seen how recruiters are dealing with. And I'm sorry, but, uh, and this is what I remember I, I mentioned to her as well. When, it's, when you own the business, it's, everything is in your hands how many clients you want. Because then you know how much, what kind of profit you want to make because you know the time that you will need to put in to, to create those you know, to fill those roles. Yeah. Now, when it comes to in-house, you don't have that leverage. You, someone is redundant in your team, they don't replace you, you get the workload. Um, you have hiring managers coming into the office all the time, like knocking, you know, on your desk, like, where are my candidates? I needed them now. And you're juggling. I've seen recruiters work 40, 50 recs at a time. No, absolutely. This is and nowhere that- near healthy. That's when you go to agencies because you're like, your, your managers want CVs and you know you're not going to get them or the ones you're going to get do not have quality. And then you go to an agency and you expect to have CVs in you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, because that's what you're used to. Um, and it's, it, you know, that, that then put on agencies. So you get that whole thing of agencies like, oh, if you don't send uh, candidates within 48 hours, you lost the deal. And it's like, why do we, you know, as in-house recruiters, we don't, we know we're not going to find candidates within that. So it's like, how do we expect to get quality candidates within 48 hours? Um, we know we're not going to find that, but we expect the agency partners that we have to have. But I'm like, that's not going to be, you might be lucky that like there's some good people who just became available, but likelihood is, uh, which I think is 90% of the can- that, that the agencies is like, they have LinkedIn recruiter. They go in every morning, just like they used to do on Monster, where we looked at who's the, who's uploaded their CV. Now it's who's available, you know, who's looking, who's open for opportunities on LinkedIn. You know, that's going to be, and then it's like who's the quickest to, you know, to be in that niche and to email that specific candidate or email that specific candidate within, you know, an hour of them changing their LinkedIn profile. Um, mm-hmm. I don't see, so that hasn't changed since when I started in the 90s. Um, kind of looking at agencies and things like that. And it's like, well, it's like, you know, oh, you uploaded your CV on Monster. It's like, you know, Monday morning, it was about being there at six in the morning. So you can call that person as a first person. It hasn't changed. It's still the same. Um, I used to make fun of agencies when, when you know, when I came back to Denmark as well, uh, especially some of the old fashioned kind of where you would put an ad in a newspaper. Uh, it was, you know, we have a client and they're looking for an application deadline is that. And all they did was si- sifting through CVs. And like for them, even the internet was something new. This was when I came back in 2008. Uh, and I was like, you're way behind. But that whole kind of thing. And they're like, oh, but we have a database. It's like, we all have a database. It's called LinkedIn. It's like that database that used to be the bread and butter of all, and I still, I mean, I spoke at an event with Hong Lee a couple of years ago, um, you know, I think a hundred agency owners and it was all the same. It's like, what's your biggest asset? It's like, well, we have a database. It's like, you have nothing. We all have Google, LinkedIn, you know, and now GDPR is coming. You have absolutely nothing uh, because unless you update, you know, unless you get their approval every six months, then you have to delete their data. So it's like, what do you actually have? Uh, you yeah. you don't have anything nobody else has. Like I have as much access as you do, even though you've been in business for twenty years. Yeah, um, and that's and, and the you kind know, of thing. I, I totally agree because with when it comes to managing data, first of all, I'm not going to generalize, but I've seen a lot of lazy recruiters who don't care about filling any details about people that they speak to, uh, 
they don't put proper tags or they don't assign them into the right projects because they don't care. And But I understand that side of things because if I would have 40 recs to work on, I'm not sure if I would care either. No. No. But this is, I think this, but as you know, I'm not saying that agencies are not busy. They're busy, but they're Just under question. a different pressure, what you mentioned about, and this is not healthy either. And it's how can we find that balance, right? Because even financially, it's very different. Um, and this is a big shift that um, when, when we were talking to agency recruiters or sourcers, um, their financial expectations are crazy because they're used to bonuses. They, they want to have, yeah, they're looking at like, this is what I made last year. So I know in-house don't be, they might get a bonus, but I want what I got last year, but basically as basic salary. And that doesn't work. No. Because you, this is the big shift that, um, that's why we would be saying that, look, are you really ready to make this jump? Because it might take you six months until you actually land an interview, because it's not that easy. Like if you really think how many agencies are out there in the UK, thousands, thousands. So the amount of people that come in, uh, we are in the industry that doesn't need necessarily require training or certification or anything. Anyone can actually come and do the job. So that's why the attrition in the industry is massive because a lot of agencies, they bring in people and they put so much pressure on them. And then, you know, they fire everyone, what, you know, a few months later or within the, within the trial period and so on. So if money is your main motivation and that's why you go into recruitment, that kind of attitude will never work in in-house. On the other hand, uh, as someone who is uh, going through interviews myself, I had very interesting experiences because um, I mentioned this when, when I was doing the talk and that discussion that, you know, I had a situation where I was talking to an agency and I was talking to in-house. And when it comes to talking about the salary expectations, I said exactly the same number. Uh, in the agency uh, world, that was seemed to be very big number. And I was offered, let's say, 10,000 less than that, which is a, a big cut, um, you know, with promising that, oh, uh, we would need to give you training. And, and so, so I understand that, you know, when it comes to training, I would, I would take on board like a cut, right? And on the other hand, when I said exactly the same number for, uh, for the in-house team, I was told that actually I'm being very uh, modest. Are you selling yourself? Right? Uh, but this is my strategy in the sense that it's, if you don't know something, be open about it rather than brag about the things that you don't know just to impress someone. Because, you know, in reality, when someone in-house tells you that you are worth more, then what you're even asked for, this is incredible. So, you know, you would be surprised how many people, like, the motivation behind trying to go in-house was that, oh, I'm just tired of agency. Uh, yeah. there, there are a lot of people who think that in-house is so much easier. No. And I believe that, again, I'm going to repeat myself, those are two different worlds. Because um, the way I see agency, and this is from my experience, but you work on a rec, uh, if you're lucky, maybe you want to work with one exclusive client and you just have multiple recs. Or you, you unfortunately, maybe you have 10 different clients, like what Lee was saying, right? Um, but in reality, when you are only representing one brand and there are more layers to it, uh, you can... You can be involved in strategic uh, strategic plans on how to how to improve the processes, how to find the right talent, attending different events, organizing meetups. Uh, there are like diving into different and more deeper initiatives that actually can mm -hmm. uh, create the brand awareness. Uh, there are so many things that recruiters are actually doing that maybe. Uh, agency recruiters um, are not simply are not aware of. I, but, I mean, a, a lot of the things is some. I think the big difference is like in house we represent the company and uh, the jobs. Agencies tend to represent the 
candidates. Uh, whereas, and, I mean, that's the benefit of the agency model is that you have that, you know, perfect candidate for that niche job. Uh, of course, you're going to put them forward to your client that you have, but you're also going to put them forward to the two, three other clients that have a similar role that's currently interviewing because, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, that, that one in five candidates that interviews and gets the job, that, that you don't need to have five candidates all the time, that your candidate is interviewing for three jobs at the same time, who are all your clients, so that when they get the job, it's one of your clients, that like you, you get them the best job that they can. And that was my biggest frustration being in-house. It's like, you know, we all had that. We spoke with that really perfect candidate just not for that specific role that we had, but we knew that like there's probably a role coming up. Like I've said before, like with people that I've been speaking to, it's like based on what you're looking for and your experience, like the role that I have is simply not for you. Um, and I might get something in the next six months and I'll let you know if I do, but I, I don't want to waste your time. I would yeah. love to have said like, but I have another client you can, you know, uh, like I've had to say before, and I've done that a couple of times. So it's like, I have a friend who works in this company. I know that they're looking for somebody like you. Here's her number. Here's her email. Uh, yep. Contact her because I think like that's the company that you would be looking for. Uh, the role that we have is not for you, you know, that kind yep. of thing. And that's the power I have now as an agency. It's like, if I speak to that, you know, shit hot candidate, I'm like, okay, I have four different different companies that you know are you ready to relocate because then like we're expanding that to much many many more companies um because i know it's like okay this company's looking i know my colleague has been looking at that so i can put you know i can put her in in the in play with that uh, client as well and then it's about like which client is going to move the fastest uh because it's about getting getting people through the system and and one more thing is i believe that which is a big difference that in agency, it's, it's, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of competition between, between people who's going to have a bigger, bigger amount of placements and so on and so on. In house, yes, you have KPIs that you need to perform. However, it's more about collaboration. It, it depends. So I've worked in a lot of in house, uh, and some in house teams, like you wouldn't know it's not an agency. Like they'll stab you in the back if that means that they can steal your candidate. Um, so it really depends. I mean, both, like we both know, right? Like, like we've worked in some really cool teams and we know some really cool teams, but I've also worked with people that, you know, they, they did not wish me well. Um, and, you know, like there was very few people that was happy if I made a placement, they would rather not see me make it. Like, so you I, have I know the, the same feeling. Thing. I mean, I caught quite a few of my colleagues stab me in the back without them even knowing what I know. Yeah. And that's the power. When, when, when you know that you can't trust this person anymore, there's not going to be any relationship there. Well, I mean, based on the 20 years of my experience, uh, the agency is very much about competitiveness. It's about constantly performing. You don't have a day off. You don't, you know, you don't take three weeks of holiday because then you're not making money. Uh, In-house is very political. It's like you need to find, you either lucky and you find a, you find a company where you don't have to pay the political game because most of it is political. It's like, you know, you, you think you have a friend and that friend is going to stab you in the back if that means a promotion or, you know, whatever it is. And it's like, you have to tread really. I mean, one of the reasons why my wife works from home because I can, and just does, you know, contracts and remote because she was so tired of that, that whole kind of office vibe, people stabbing each other in the back um, and that kind of thing. And she's like, look, I'm, I'm too old for this. I'm like, 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 let me just, let me do my yeah. job. Uh, let me talk to candidates. Let me, you know, do what I'm good at, but keep me out of that whole political game. And it's like, completely understand. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, it, you know, like uh, looking at how much we can talk about this and <laughs> there are so many other points that we could touch upon, but uh, I believe in looking at what we had a week ago that it, it was a, it was a good conversation in the sense that we need to talk about it more. And uh, yes, there were a lot of technical issues and so on, but it, it, I don't believe that one hour is enough because no, I mean, it this was is, very, it, I, I would love to hear even more what uh, both Debbie and Lee were, had to say, but we could have a podcast. Technical Debbie, issues, like it just yeah. didn't allow, uh, you know, I was guessing a lot, like reading lips of trying to understand what potentially <laughs> Debbie is saying, but uh, it, it is tricky, so... 
We could have a podcast every week where you would buy an in-house recruiter and an agency recruiter um, and, you know, talk about different topics. Because, I mean, like, you know, I'm back in agency and I'm like, hats off for the people who've done, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years of, of agency. It's like, I wanted to go back into agency and see can what I learned from, you know, almost 20 years of experience with all the tools and things like that that still doesn't make it easier. Like it's still, I, again, like I'm, because I'm starting from scratch, I don't come with a ready-made network unless I went in and did RPO. Uh, that might be the only niche that, you know, I might actually have a chance in because I have a fairly good network in recruitment. Uh, but because it's still like, yes, there's a few candidates that I can talk to that I can talk to in the past, but it, it's still very much like I'm building up completely like, you know, my database from scratch. And then, uh, the agency I work with is is like part, you know, embedded. So we work with a few clients where we are essentially their, you know, their recruitment. And then some uh, some new clients, which is like we're just an agency um, with contingent. So we're not niche enough to say like, oh, this candidate is definitely for this. And, you know, you know, we're on three different continents. So if I'm working San Francisco, I can't exactly pitch that same person to a client in, in Amsterdam. So, you know, that's the kind of thing. It's like in an ideal world, like, yeah, you build that up over years. And it's like, I simply like, that's not what I'm, like, what I'm bringing is a lot of the tools, which depending on what you're looking for can be useful, but yeah, it's, it's still as hard as it was when I was agency the first time. And that was 2006. Um, so yeah, um, you know, 15 years later back in an agency and it's still not easier. So, you know, that's exactly, exactly. And, and, and that's the thing that, um, I think there's stigma that you, you can only be in one side, like, but that, you know, we are a really good example of it. We're being between one and two, like, you know, you're just jumping from one ship to Be another. And because we know that there's things to learn from everybody. And I'm like, the, the, you know, the last kind of four or five months where it's like, I'm, I'm back in agency, but it's an agency run by in-house recruitment managers. So like they also have both sides and I'm learning a lot, which I know that if I was on their team in an in-house team, there wouldn't be time for. Um, so I'm learning a lot from my colleagues, from my managers, you know, from the, the, the founders of the company um, that I know I wouldn't learn in an in-house environment. And like, there's no way I would learn in a traditional agency because they wouldn't have the in-house experience. Um, so yeah, definitely like, which is why I do it. I always try to challenge myself to, to get out of my own comfort zone. And like going back to agency was definitely something that I knew was out of my comfort zone. Um, and, you know, that I, I still working hard to, you know, to get to the results that I want, but I'm learning a lot at the same time, which is, that's why it's not boring. And that's why I can continue doing this job after, you know, almost 20 years of it. Wow, so many things to learn from. <laughs> that's incredible. And I, uh, yeah, there was another uh, this week. Um, I, I sent it to you as well. Um, there was a, a, a senior sourcer from Uber in the US, uh, Mallory, uh, put out, well, it's a, it's one of those that comes out once in a while when it's like, we just feel like ranting. And I normally just call you or call Katrina Collier and rant over after that. Uh, Mallory put a post out where I, obviously, she's a senior sourcer at Uber. Uh, if you know anything about the team at Uber, uh, you know that that's the, you know, some of our best friends and, you know, SourceCon grandmaster people are sourcing at Uber. Um, that definitely they, they are the kind of place to be at the moment in the US and, and to some extent Europe as well. Um, they have some really strong people there. Um, what she was complaining about is that she's getting a lot of, people coming to her or you know probably emailing her about uh sales sales development roles recruitment coordinator roles junior recruiter roles because she's a sourcer and the definition of like most kind of where well, she's like because she's a sourcer and people think that that's a junior role that's the kind of jobs that she gets uh get poached um that conversation and like the kind of it it derailed completely i mean she had 130 comments, uh, almost 1700, you know, reactions to this post. Um, and it's, it's, it's things that come up constantly in like sourcing is a specialism. Uh, and she's, a, she's a proud sourcer, uh, with a company where she knows she makes a difference and like, we're definitely, um, and like that kind of thing. But yeah, the conversation kind of was like, well, you should be happy that you're like, 
you know that that, that the roles you could you could have you could have impact in a role like that as well. It's like that's not the point. What she tried to make is that sourcing is a specialism, not a junior recruiter role. Um, and yeah, coming back to the kind of agency, I see that as well. Where it's like, well, you get somebody who has no experience in recruitment, you get them in first, and you call them a sourcer. That's then a step to become before you become a recruiter, and that. That makes sense from an agency world. If you're a resourcer and then you kind of graduate to a consultant, it makes less sense now in-house, which is what she is, because especially with the company she's with, we are the specialists that is like, you know, we're, we're the first line of defense. Like we're the people that people talk to. Like we are the ones that actually go out and find them. Um, and we are the internal agency. We are. And that's the thing. And I mean, more and more so it's like the sourcing roles are you know where where the and i've like i know sources who are both you know high volume um specialist and executive search in-house um so there's very like it varies a lot i mean if you look at like the people that i've interviewed for the the, uh, the sourcing challenge show as well is that it's everything from you know you know whatever they do high volume to uh to executive search sourcing which is very much kind of top of funnel uh, the likes of of Eve Gein in in the Netherlands, where he's like, I only do leadership. So he says, if I send a hundred e- emails a year, that's pretty much it, because most of the people I look for, there's ten of them in like globally. So I have to catch the right person at the right time to them to be interested. And then that you know, you get that, and then you get you know, complete opposite, which is just like, well, we need to pump volume. Um, so you have everything, but yeah, I understand her frustration because it's like. She's called a sourcer. So somebody put a keyword up and it's like, oh, if you're a sourcer, no matter if you call yourself a senior or whatever, uh, they don't actually look at how much experience she has, purely look at title and offer her like recruitment coordinator roles, uh, you know, SDRs, which is very much kind of the you know, entry level sales role. So, but yeah, most of the discussion that came on was like, oh, a lot of people are unemployed. You should be grateful to be approached at all. I'm like, no, she has a job. Why would she? But I think it comes back to one of the discussions we had as well. It's like, we're at a kind of place where we are recognized now that sourcing is a specialism, but it's still, most people don't understand when I say that I'm a sourcer. It's like, but you, you've been in this for like 19 years. How are, you know, I'm like, it's a title, but it's something I'm proud of because for me, it's see, I see it as a specialism. Like just like if I was a doctor and then I specialized in something, I wouldn't just call myself a doctor. I would call myself whatever specialist in my radiologist, have. for example. Exactly. So it's like because it takes, you know, it's taken me 19 years to get the experience that I have now to be able to do the sourcing piece of it to the best that I can, and I'm still learning. But that still doesn't mean that I would take you a junior role tomorrow. Exactly, and and especially when you have a job, you don't necessarily care about talking about the jobs that are irrelevant at all. Yeah. And um, I'll never forget like, one of the agencies that I used to work for. Basically, I was a sourcer. Uh, ba- well, there was me and the other one. Um, the other person was very new to sourcing. So I was the only one who had experience and knew what sourcing is. And then at some point, the manager was like, oh, you know, we want to create like sourcing function in the agency uh, and so on. And it's like, yeah, sounds cool. Um, but every person that we were bringing into the agency had no idea what sourcing is. They were bringing people without zero experience. And uh, the worst part was that uh, one day he said, oh, I discovered uh, the best way how to identify a sourcer, like during an interview. And I said, oh, I'm really curious. What do you ask? He said, well, imagine if I come like, okay, so you are a sourcer and I'm that manager. Like, and this is a job interview. And he would come and say, um, so um, I have this rec that another recruiter is working on and we have like a hundred applications. Can you take a look and do the screening? And I was like, okay. And what did the person say? It's like, so those who say no, we don't hire them. I said, well, in that case, you're not hiring sourcers because sources, if you, I believe that if you are, because sourcers can be expensive resource. That's the thing. We're not coordinators. No, and we're not cheap. We're not junior. Like, yes, at the beginning when you start, you might be potentially junior. But what people need to understand that even salaries can be equal to, to recruiters. Because in the companies that have the right strategy, 
those two will be working together. Um, and it, it should com- not it be- It comes back to that kind of agency thing. It's like, just like an agency would build up that network and that pool and that pipeline, that's what the source of does in house. Like yeah. you might, you can, and I, I remember Balash in a talk some years ago as well, where he says, if you're looking for quick results, uh, don't set up a sorting team because yeah. you won't. He says, you can easily. And then we had that when I worked with Natalie at ThoughtWorks as well, where it's like, that's what we put that very, this is not a quick fix to anything. No. This is going to take you six months before you show results. Yeah. If that's what you want. But what you get is that, and I, you know, in-house recruiters don't have time to source that most don't have time to source. Uh, I've sat down with many kind of going through what's your, you know, what's your strategy working with this manager. And they're like, well, once a week I go to LinkedIn, uh, I send some emails and that's pretty much it. Cause the rest of the time they're in interviews, they're doing employment branding, they're meeting with managers that, you know, all of the other things that the in-house recruiter does that the agencies don't see because they don't, you know, they're not in and they don't look at their calendar. They don't have the time to source. So what sourcing does is that we're the ones that build that network. We, that go out and like, we look at, the team we look at what are the companies we want to have like so rather than saying it's like oh today i'm going to look through competitor x because i know like well we're going to map competitor x i'm going to know what they have for breakfast and when their bonus is and what their salary levels are and you know when they get hired and you know when what what time of year that and if anybody's talking about people getting let go from that competitor i have a list that we can email in 10 minutes so that we can, you know, we can get all of those. That's what a sourcer does. It's very much that kind of, you know, top of funnel, competitive intelligence on the candidate side, um, you know, knowing all of those things, knowing who's what, what is the different roles, the different levels in our competitor, like who are we talking to? Because we're not starting the same role over and over again. Like we know what we're hiring for. So we can look back from the last three years of hires. It's like, where did they come from? Who did good? Who is still here? who did not do so good after we hired them or in the interview process, let's see, you know, how can we tweak that? Um, and that's what a sourcer does, but we don't deliver quickly unless, you know, that's what you hired us for. And that, I mean, that's the kind of thing that my wife is working on where she's like, she has a month, uh, works on two roles and it's like, she needs to find people, but she starts completely from scratch new country oh, there's nothing yeah from no she has nothing it's like new country new new roles uh new company that you know half the time she hasn't even heard of that company and like within you know within a day she's ha- has to represent a company to potential candidates who've never heard of them either um you know and that's like that's the chase and that's the fun part for her and she's good at it uh but at the same time it's like that's that's the hard piece it's like having that kind of thing it's like you can do that as a sourcer but most of the time it's really for us to build up that kind of like, we're building up the intelligence on where to find these people and then we find them. So I think we spoke about it last week, uh, the week before, eh, one of those weeks. Uh, Andre Bradshaw, uh, good friend, good friend of the show, uh, frequent commenter on YouTube uh, for every time we upload a show. Um, he finally, he did a video uh, put on his YouTube. Obviously, I'm going to put a link to that where he explained the research that he did uh, around sourcing. Um, so it comes back to what we just talked about kind of, you know, with titles and with sourcer. Andre took, uh, basically went on LinkedIn and found all the people that are talent acquisition recruitment and has sourcing as a keyword or in their title uh, and looked at all of those and kind of found out after he took out all the procurement people. Uh, and, you know, he explains all the kind of people he took out. Um, but you know, what he, he got out of that was to kind of look at, well, I think 2019 was the peak uh, kind of globally. And he has that broken down in different countries of people who either call themselves sourcers or have like, you know, a title where they do a lot of sourcing. And then it's, you know, gone down from there. And obviously last year, big dip. Uh, and I just thought it was a it was interesting because we kind of talked to it from the article that Ballas wrote, which was partly written on a very early, it was an early stage of the research. And actually the, 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 the research, the, the graph that Ballas used was uh, not the total number of uh, titles, was like the new people, like new people that came into sourcing in those years. Uh, but yeah, definitely um, uh, Andre has a, 
website up. I'll link to that as well, where you can go in and you can actually look at the data. You can zoom in. You can like manipulate it. Uh, it's just a really good indication of. Uh, we've seen that as well, like both of us. It's like, you know, we, we've been in since sourcing was still very much like, what are we and what do you do? And then to now, you know, yeah, 2019, probably everybody calls themselves sourcing or some variation of. Uh, and that's kind of gone out now. Uh, one, I think, because a lot of us has kind of, well, you know, I took a 360 recruiter role, full stack recruiter role with a heavy emphasis on sourcing. I haven't had a pure sourcing role for a long time because it's simply like you got to go with where the business is and what the economy looks like. And in these times, it's kind of like most companies want somebody that does the, the whole, you know, full cycle uh, and, you know, the full stack. And I end up taking jobs where I know a lot of it is sourcing, but that's more based on experience. But like if I this is like I'm only going to do sourcing, the number of roles that would be open for me, especially again, coming back to experience level would be very limited. So it, I, I like the research. Um, obviously, Andre does what, Brett, what Andy always does, but I, I love that he made a video where he explains the research and not just put it out there and then you know leave it open to. So I think it's like 20 minutes, half an hour where he goes through the research, um, talks about like kind of what he took out and what he's still working on and what he wants to put in there. Uh, I love pretty much everything Andre does, which is, uh, you know, as always, um, Trish Rebel did an interview as well, I think last week, um, as part of uh, you, uh, YouTube interviews, again, on uh, his Facebook group. Um, so I'll link to that as well, because there was another, like, yeah, just getting to know Andre better. And he talked a little bit about the research as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, you can never get enough of Andre. So, yeah, go to his Patreon as well. Definitely highly recommended. Uh, there's always whatever he's working on comes out there first. By the way, talking about Triss's group, last, last week I went in a bit on fire in that group. Uh, but um, I don't know those who have followed the group. Um, it's a cool group, uh, giving a lot of uh, really good and valued content. But there was one post in particular that I didn't really appreciate. And um, maybe the tone of it, uh, Triss knows it. We, we had a you know one-on-one -on -one conversation <laughs> about it. Uh, basically... Um, he was, uh, he shared, a, he shared a, a, he shared a post from, uh, LinkedIn, I think, was it from Brain Food? No, it was the Brain Food something. Facebook group. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, where, uh, our friend Mark, uh, from Elastic, he was, uh, he opened up again. He does it a lot, uh, about struggles when he is trying to find people. And basically, not, not, Chris, not finding developers, but finding technical recruiters to who join know team. what yeah, exactly. tech is. Yes. yes. And someone who spoke to Mark, um, it was just before I was, I remember I accepted, I was recommended to talk to him for a job uh, when he was looking for a tech recruiter because his team is growing anyway. Um, and I was recommended to speak to him, but that was already, I accepted the offer with Adidas that I had. And, and I said, look, I don't want to waste your time, but I would be happy to talk to you. Yeah. It, I mean, I'm open because this is going to be a short, short contract. And I remember we jumped on the call. It was supposed to be 30 minutes. We ended up talking for one hour or so, mm -hmm. even longer. And I was blown away about how, how incredibly open he is. Um, because, you know, I, I wasn't looking anything from him specifically. So we were not necessarily talking about the, it was not the job interview. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we connected and uh, we, we could understand that we do see certain things in a similar way, even though, of course, I lack certain specific knowledge, right? So when I saw Trissa's post, uh, you know, everything went okay until the moment when it was his PSS. And he said, oh, uh, I, I don't have the code right now, but is it, is it just one of, uh, of another in-house recruiters trying to show, show off or something? I don't think, I think it wasn't just that. It was that the, the first commenter on the post was somebody who just joined uh, the growth hacking recruiter like, group. I mean, this group has been there since 2018, 17. 
when Jan said that uh, growth hacking was the, the new it, uh, so I think that was 2018, uh, Trish started that group, I think, yes, about a couple of months before we started the, the sourcing challenge. So, you know, it's been around as much. And it's like somebody who just, she just joined like November or something like that. And then very, and Mark has, this isn't the first time Mark's talked about this. Mark was yeah. on uh, Sourcing Summit Virtual, did a talk about exactly the same thing. And he has standing, is like Mark is an engineer uh, with, you know, a long career as an engineer and turned a recruiter. And what he was complaining about was having quote unquote tech recruiters talking, you know, keywords to him where he's like, he can hear that they don't know what they're talking about. But unlike other tech recruiters, he knows in depth what he's talking about because he has a long career as an engineer. Um, and what he was pointing out is like, look, if I catch these recruiters talking BS in an interview, the candidates will do the same thing. Um, and he's like, I, I don't I don't mind you don't have the in-depth, but don't try to BS me like I can hear the difference. And I mean, this and this. Yeah, he's done this over the last year. Like, like he's done this talk a couple of times. And like this post was just similar to that was like and was open about this is the questions that I ask. And this is what I would expect. Um, yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's from the basic kind of like that's turned into a meme now where it's like Java and JavaScript. You know, it's like, yes, it's not the same. It's like that's the first thing you learn. Um, but at the same time, but like, you know, he took it for more than that, just like, well, and broke down what he would ask in a, in a, in a, in an interview situation. It's like, not what he, he would ask. He, him. Ba yeah. he basically gave away the cheat sheet, how to crack his interview. And it's not just him. Like if you can get past Mark in an interview situation as a technical recruiter, you will probably do a lot better as well when you're talking to senior technical candidates. Yeah. Um, or other people who actually know what you know what they're talking about. So go back, read that you know, read that uh, that you know that post, and actually read it, and not as somebody as an in-house recruiter showing off. And why do you? So he wrote that he'd interviewed thirty. What he didn't write because I I know he's been talking about this before. It's like he's interviewed thirty. That like that doesn't mean it's for one role. Like over the last couple of years. Yeah. He's interviewed 30 technical recruiters um, and, you know, only one of them actually knew what they were talking about. That's what he was, what he was saying. And it's like, and we've probably all been in situations like that as well. It's like people we thought looked good on paper when they opened their mouth, there was like, you're, you don't actually know what you're talking about. And it's, you just, you, you're trying too hard, but it's, you're not actually, and like, they're not taking on when you're like, yeah, but that's not really how it works, is it? Uh, when you're trying to give them hints and that I think that's part of it as well but yeah he, he gave you the cheat sheet on how to what to prepare and how to think and not just interviewing with him but I think as a really good guide for if you're interviewing for a technical recruiter job these are some of the things that you should be ready to answer uh, and I think anybody who's hiring technical recruiters should look at this as well as just like am I thinking about this am I asking these questions would I know the answer to these questions? Like even ask the, the, the person who's hiring it. So yeah, definitely. Especially when that comes from a former engineer himself. Yeah. That's the, that's the essence of it. And, yeah. uh, you know, in my career, I had a lot of conversations, job interviews. And, and, you know, what we had with Mark, that was not a job interview. That was just a friendly conversation. And we had, you know, conversations at different events as well. And we even had a conversation after that, you know, last week, you know, of the ping pongy shit. But, um, you know, for me, uh, you know, that whole situation, uh, you know, it kind of reminded me that I'm always uh, fighting the, uh, fighting some kind of imagine, imaginary windmills. Um, but uh, I just felt that for certain things in that situation, they were a bit odd. And, and I just wanted to make clear that this is not okay to do this kind of stuff no. because there was a lot of, like, it felt that it was constructed to, to attract attention that was not needed. Yeah. Uh, instead of taking the, putting it from a positive light, it was kind of, oh, it's okay to actually 
put all the bad stuff now because I, mean, I give that space. If you want that, you go to animals group. Yeah. So, uh, and, 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 you know, and for those who read it, uh, for example, um, I, I just want to tell you one thing that, and this is one thing that I've learned in my life that sometimes when we see situations that we don't agree to, it's worth stepping up and it's worth doing something about it. Yeah. And it's worth saying something. Um, you don't know where that would lead to. I can give you like a really funny situation where it was insane. I was, uh, I was attending Chet Faker's uh, gig in London. Uh, he is one of the most known Australian indie artists. Now he changed his name. He's very different name right now. But um, I always wanted to see him. Uh, the very first chart on my, on my blog that I did six years ago had his song as number one. Uh, so there's a lot of things involved and I'll never forget there was like a VIP zone and then behind VIP you have like all the other people. So <laughs> I was all the other people like third row or something. And there was a, a bunch of maybe six, uh, six, like three couples. So six people, they were a bit tipsy and they were even smoking inside of the venue. They were so bonkers. Um, and they were making so much noise. They didn't care about music. They did this disrespect at everyone around. And I was just like already fuming because I couldn't focus on the music. I could hear only them. And I politely said, look, can you please tone it down? And then they started, oh, you know, of course. But then the guys disappeared and there were only a few girls left. And I was like, look, you know, when the official concert ended, you know, you're waiting for that encore when... Uh, when you will get something extra and they started screaming and this and that and like he started playing a jazz piece which is not his kind of vibe at all and they started who the fuck he thinks he is playing this stuff give us this give us that and it's like <laughs> look you know what now this is a sold off gig there are plenty of people who couldn't get in. You obviously don't respect yourself. You don't respect him and you don't respect anyone around you. Can you please leave? The gig that you paid for is done. Yeah. Just, just get out because everyone was like, Shh. and then, you know, uh, I did it because I was frustrated. Yeah. I didn't do it for anyone else because I knew that there were so many people around me who wanted to say something but we just couldn't because, you know, we should not do that, right? <laughs> but if you feel that trigger that this is the time to speak, you have to do it. And the reason why I'm telling this story that um, I, I, I had a tap on my shoulder and, and there were two women behind me and they're like, well done. I was like, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then when the gig finished, uh, you know, by the time, you know, you get to the you know, out of the hall, it's, it's a long journey. So one of those women, she, she, because I was behind them, so she turned to me, she thanked me and she said, can I just check what did they tell you uh, when, when, when they started kind of telling you back, telling you off? I said, well, one of them said that, oh, I work in the music industry. And she said, trust me, she doesn't. I work in music industry. I was like, okay, interesting. And at the time, I was working with a Swedish startup sourcing musicians, so that kind of matched. But the most incredible thing was that that was the person who signed Chet Faker in Australia six years ago <laughs> for his first record deal. She wasn't VIP. She wasn't in the backstage. She was row four. She was yeah. one of the people <laughs> in the audience. And I got to talk to her just because of the simple fact that I told someone to shut the fuck up when that was really due. I'm sorry about all the swear words. You know, I'm sure you might even cut the whole thing out. But, but you know, but it just shows that, you know, um, I, I always say that it's not about being liked by many. It's about doing what you feel is right. Because uh, you never know when you're going to meet people again in your life. And you, for me, it's important to stand to, for what you believe in. And, uh, and, you know, and for me, just that was a very natural reaction. I wasn't thinking about what the consequences that it can get me into. No. Because I knew that everyone who has some kind of reasoning, 
they would know what I mean. And, yeah. you know, and that was just that. So, I mean, you know, I remember a year ago when I posted, don't, uh, I posted a photo of if you get an in, in mail, don't respond. That was, <laughs> oh, that's I, lot, mean, yeah. I mean, there were people telling me that I might lose my speaking, uh, speaking spot at Sosu V in Germany because of that. <laughs> I was like, look, people just back off. If you read my post, you will understand what I meant. But they don't. They read the headline. It's similar to like all of those things that go on on Facebook where it's like, and the reason I know you probably only read the headline is because you click on the article. It's like, it's not actually open. You have to pay for it. I'm like, how many, you know, uh, have you just, you just doing clickbait and you're like anything. Yeah. Uh, and I know most people don't like, like, and they've done studies that most people don't actually post. Like, they don't actually yeah. read the. So like, yeah, they don't read your they just look at the headline, something, or and somebody they, else they reacted, like the and they also they like the photo. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Uh, the next thing I have is a, a well, something you found is that the free OSINT training. Yeah, and how I discovered that because uh, our friend Irina uh, Shimaeva that we mention every now and then, uh, she was in one of the Facebook groups. She was asking. Hey, I'm I'm doing this talk and I have slides and I want someone to look at my slides and just give my give, give feedback. Um, and, and I said, hey, you know, I have some time. I would love to to see what you what you're up to because when Irina speaks, she always finds not only speaks when she writes online, like she always shares a lot of content that is very useful. And I was really I was like, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't do that? So uh, then the next day when I, when I saw her share this, I was like, wow, this is really cool. And uh, it looks like a very cool event as well. And it is free. So if you have some time, I don't think that there's anything wrong in joining the OSINT events. No, and, and it, it I, I see. Know more about that. So exactly, I see. Uh, if you're if you're following that the OSINT Curious podcast, uh, a lot of these names will uh, uh, will be will be something that you can see. And yeah, uh, I see here, Ivina Shamaiver is going to be on uh, on that as well. So uh, definitely. and she and and I have to tell you, like some of the stuff that she has on those slides, <laughs> I was like, wow, this is really clever. So. Um, I was like, I was really, really impressed. I, I can't imagine how she can come up with so much new stuff all the time. Like, Ivina is a researcher. It's incredible. She, very much so. And she's always, she always has been like, she will be the one that has the latest, uh, you know, the latest and greatest about changes on LinkedIn. Whenever there's an update, and because LinkedIn isn't like, you know, your, your phone where that's going to update and you can see the things that's like, it's not it's not necessarily very clear that there's an update to LinkedIn. She will know what the latest version of LinkedIn is and yeah. you know what the changes was, good and bad, and how you can get back to the older version, like because that actually works better and you know some of the hacks that we use. So yeah, again, definitely like some of we've talked about Rina before. So yeah, uh, any like all of her articles on um on on her website is definitely worth. But yeah, this is definitely an event that like I would go to as well, uh, because there's a lot of people from the OSINT world uh, and I know that they do a lot of research as well. They don't just put a, you know, a talk out there without having thoroughly researched and actually used that in practice. Um, so, and you know, free is a good price. Uh, you, you normally get what you pay for, but I think in, in this, uh, this case, you get, you get a lot more than what you pay for. Exactly. Cool. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, I think one of the, the last things, um, I, I always said that I wanted to recommend other podcasts and uh, I, like more and more coming up now, uh, you can go to, you can go to Hong Lee's list of, I think there's God knows so many podcasts now, uh, not all of them are active. Um, and, you know, I, I really wanted to point out podcasts that I listen to um, that are relevant and that actually gets updated. One of the ones that I've listened to in the last week uh, is, uh, it's a, a it's a relatively new podcast um, by Marcus Edwards. Um, he's called Recruiting Trailblazers. Uh, he's had Guillaume um, from uh, Lemlist, uh, who's been uh, he was on on one of the tools episode of the Sourcing Challenge show. A good friend of you know, Sourcing he's Challenge. He's really awesome. Yeah. Um, and you know that was a really good interview a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then a uh, very good friend of mine and the show uh, Vanessa Rath uh, was the one that I listened to. So. 
Uh, it was released um, on Recruiting Trailblazers uh, at the end of January. Uh, I just listened to it last week. Uh, definitely, I mean, if you haven't listened to my interview with Vanessa, go back and do that. But uh, you know, just as much this one as well. Vanessa is one of those people that have really come into her own in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, the whole lockdown and COVID has not wasn't to begin with. It didn't look good for her, but she just took that and made the most out of it. So going from training um, people in South Africa and doing sourcing to now she's doing that globally. Like I know she's up in the middle of the night because she's doing sourcing training in uh, in Australia um, from her house in South Africa. Um, so that kind of whole story, uh, it builds a bit on the story from like when we left off, when 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 I when my interview with Vanessa was finished, to what she's done the last couple of years. So definitely uh, recommend uh, subscribing and following recruiting trailblazers, and definitely uh, listening to uh, to the episode for, with Vanessa Rast. And we already know that uh, there are quite a few of our friends launching podcasts really soon. So we will be updating that list uh, in the in the in the episodes to follow. I'm, I'm happy. Uh, means like I, I put in a, a I, I have my uh, podcast batch depending on kind of what mood I'm in. Um, so I have a business one. I have a, you know, I have one that's called recruiting and I'm constantly kind of putting new things in there. And it's like, it doesn't mean that I've listened to all of them, uh, but sometimes I'm like, okay, let me go through. And I just, I go through and this was, which is why I'm a bit behind on listening to this one. I really love this one. Um, and like, Vanessa always had a have a good story. Uh, I've been lucky enough to meet her a couple of times and consider her a good friend. So definitely go in and listen to it. Uh, and yeah, I, I see good things happening with uh, with recruiting trailblazers. I wish uh, Marcus all the best of luck with it because we all know how how hard it is to do a podcast, especially an interview podcast like he is, and he's really getting some good guests on there. Um, so yeah, uh, I highly recommend you go and follow that and, and subscribe to his show as well. Amazing. As always, we will be back next week uh, with a, for another show. Um, if you have anything you would like us to talk about or you have any feedback, uh, you know where to find us. You are sourcers. Dove and I are not hard to find. Um, so definitely do that. If you are looking for all the links and the show notes for this episode, it will be in uh, sourcingchallenge.com slash weekly eight. Um, you'll have both the video embedded, the audio embedded, and uh, all the links to the things that we talked about in this show. So yeah. Uh, Wait a second. So it's two months that we're doing this. Time flies. Two months. I can't, I can't believe this. We're episode eight. So uh, yeah, this. Uh, if you're new, if you're new this week to uh, to this show, uh, there's another six hours of content that you can go back and listen to. Um, so yeah, we will, uh, we'll continue doing this. And, and, and at the same time, it feels like this is going to be on the longer version. I think it does every yeah. week though. It always feels like we, like we finished these ones. It's like, that was a long one. And then it's like, it's normally within the same range. And it's like, okay, yeah. it just felt like a lot longer. Yeah, no, it's amazing. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And, and I always look forward to, and, and quite a few already people who, who know me and my friends, like they know that Tuesday evening is booked. <laughs> I'm not moving. I'm not changing. This is one of the best things that happens during the week. So it's always awesome to do that. And we'll be back next week um, with new updates and, and new ideas and, and conversations around sourcing. So thank you for tuning in and catch you next week. See you then.